You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show with your host, Brian Callen. I give you TP9. Freeway. Rick mm-hmm. Ross's <laughs> protege. Mm-hmm. Got to see her hair and the way she moves. All right, all right. There it is. I'll give you a little taste. There it is. You get a little taste of TP9. <laughs> Rick Ross is um, protege. We have um, Rick Ross, the real Rick Ross, freeway yes, Rick yes. Ross. In the house. In the house. Uh, he wrote a great book called The Untold Autobiography. Uh, we were just talking uh, about Joe Rogan, our mutual friend. Man, that's my guy. Shout out to Joe, man. Joe, Joe's a lifesaver, man. That he, dude. Uh, he's a special dude, man. Man, if we had more people in the world like Joe, man, the world would be a much better place. It really would, because he's such a generous guy. And uh, yeah, I agree with you, man. I, uh, Joe takes people as they come. And one of the things I got from the book and and reading about your life is that here was this this really intelligent, industrious person, entrepreneurial person who really didn't have a whole lot of opportunities right. let's be honest yeah, and then tough. and then you <laughs> and then you basically it's it's it is out of a movie i mean you you basically created an empire i mean and i look at you right now and and you know when you talk about a drug kingpin or you know it, it, you you just it, for me it feels like you were a guy who played tennis and by the way played tennis was looking for a scholarship and because of his academics and because of the school system couldn't get in somewhere and so had to choose another line of work yeah yep you read the book <laughs> <laughs> we always read the book on the show yeah it's important um and that, i mean i think that's the thing i mean when we talk about the academics right i mean you you said that you man you got passed through the school system from grade yeah. to grade to grade to grade and you never really learned how to read no not at all and and you know when when i look back you know i i tried to find who was at fault you know was it my mom uh you know my father wasn't at home with us when when i grew up so my mom was trying to raise uh six kids by herself and you know and do a little job when she could you know so um I was kind of raised by the streets, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Twelve years old, I started playing tennis. Thank for that, you know. Otherwise, I probably would be uh, a gang member, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe uh, doing life in the state pen for for some crazy crime that, that the Crips and the Bloods have been committing for, you know, twenty or thirty years, maybe forty years that this civil war has been going on in Los Angeles. So uh, I got fortunate that a guy put a tennis racket in my hand at twelve because at that time I wanted to be a Crip. Because mm-hmm. it was the only it was the only thing that gave a uh, boy of your age in that environment significance, right? Yeah, Power, absolutely. significance, and also autonomy. safety. I mean, I think that's the thing is is that you one of the things that you really make clear in the book is just how dangerous it was to have no gang to protect you. Oh, absolutely. If if you wasn't known in South Central, it was. I mean, you 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 know, they when I was in junior high school, they was taking tennis shoes and leather coats from people, so it was very important uh, that. You had some type of affiliation or you knew somebody that respected you that some way to give you a pass. You know, mm-hmm. you definitely didn't want to be over there and and they singled you out. I mean, the yeah. stress of living that way, the yeah. stress of living that way on a daily basis doesn't allow for any kind of potential. So think about how much human potential is wasted and lost, how many kids who could have been the CEOs of a, of a legit company, which you clearly could have been. Well, my uh, one of my close friends from college, she taught in Dorchester, Mass., which is not a wealthy area. And she would talk about how when a door would slam down the hall, she, her students wouldn't be able to focus for the rest of the day because it would, you know, trigger the memories of gunshots of, you know, family members who were in jail and all that sort of stuff. Well, you know, that, then let's get, let's get honest. That's the African-American experience yeah. a lot of, in a lot of this country. There is a, <clears throat> you can't talk about the history of the United States without talking about the African-American experience. It, you know, so much, so much of, <laughs> one of the reasons you go anywhere, any city, anywhere, why is there always a black ghetto? Is it because black people want to live in a ghetto? <laughs> no, it's because they were, they were redlined. 
um, because you couldn't get a loan if you wanted to have a house in certain areas. You, mm-hmm. The only way you were getting a loan, if you could even get one, was because you had it, it was if you wanted to live in one area. That's where people, black people, were kept. That's mm-hmm. a fact. Yeah. That's a that's a legacy of the United States. You have to contend with those issues. Those those areas were also starved of resources for a long time. So that kind of policy. And there are, of course, a lot of good uh, good people who want to change that. But that kind of policy still has its res- residue and its lasting effect. And we don't talk about that stuff enough. It gets real sticky. It gets embarrassing. It, people feel bad about it. And mainly, I think people feel bad because they don't know what to do about it. Yeah. And, and, and with the whole black experience, you know, when you start talking about the black struggle in this country, people... You know, they get real skeptical, you know, and even black people. You go to talk about slavery and stuff like that. They get to, why are you talking about that? Why mm-hmm. are you bringing that up? But you can't. I believe that every time a young black man goes to jail, especially for selling drugs, that they should talk about slavery. As soon as they get ready to sentence him, they start talking about slavery and that uh, these people have never been. Uh, habilitated. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of these guys' uh, parents are only three or four generations from 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 being sharecroppers and slaves. Well, that's a that's a really good point because the United States has been f- <clears throat> as as we speak now has been a slave holding country much longer than it has not been one. Yeah, that's what people don't realize, and I think in twenty. 20- 21 i can't remember that will we've finally also, be less will finally be it'll finally be reversed yeah but that's the thing is, is that we've never more importantly we've never dealt with what slavery was about like the the legacy of that you know i mean that choice like a tremendous injustice was done to a people and we're just like okay you're free now it's over like there's never right. <laughs> there's never been any true truth or reconciliation or and, any process of really dealing with the cycle and you tell them to catch yet. up yeah you tell them to catch up with the rest of the world after they've been uh, uh, basically incarcerated for uh, however many years. And then even after slavery, you know, there's a documentary out by the name. It's called Slavery by a Different Name. Mm-hmm. It showed that once slavery ended, then they started incarceration. Mm-hmm. So at, at, when slavery was down, there was absolutely no black men in prison. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we talk a lot about human potential on this podcast. And, and you know, if you, if you look at where African Americans have been allowed to compete... Um, mm-hmm. traditionally and where the playing field was fairly equal and that would be music and sports and by the way that was recent but well, take a either, look take a look at yeah. what and even in the arts now take a look at the what what they they were able to accomplish of in those two things so you wonder and you you think to yourself can you imagine if a guy like Rick Ross had been brought up to believe and nurtured into the idea that he could be a CEO of a company or whatever it might be? My guess is, my guess is, if you were able to do what you did with the crack epidemic and make that much money and be that organized uh, with with law enforcement breathing down your neck, my guess <laughs> is you probably would have been pretty good at, at creating a selling an, a, a legit product. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And <laughs> that's the great tragedy. And so you you yes, you must contend with the past, but I, I always believe it's a better and it's very important also to talk about what can be done now what can be done now to change that in with in real time you know what are the policies forget about blame and all that stuff we all know that stuff we can go into that but but i I like solutions and figuring out exactly how to set up a system so let's go back right so we're we're, we're, you know you're 12 years old right a tennis racket is put in your hand right Okay, for whatever reason, you believed that you could be good at tennis, right? right? What what would it have taken for you, age 12, to believe that you could be academically successful? Like, is there something that somebody could have said to you that would have convinced you? Well, at 12, I probably already was behind in my schooling. You yeah. know, at, at that time, I didn't know the sound of my ABCs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like right now, my son is 12 years, I mean, two years, three years old, and he already knows his sounds. My daughter is two years old and she already know her sounds of her ABCs and my son at three you can put a word in front of him and he'll break that word down and he'll tell you what the word is even though he don't know how to pronounce it Mm -hmm. I mean he doesn't know what the word means or what but he's learned already how to break a word down and and I believe that uh, we got to get to our children as early as I as we can in order to give them that ability to be able to read. At 12, it was too late for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, there's a, qua- there's a great quote. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King was at a <coughs> conference, and, you know, there was some woman, it was an NAACP conference, and there's a woman on stage, and she's talking about how important it is if we can just teach these kids to read, like, then they can achieve anything, blah, blah, blah. And Martin Luther King leans over to the person who is sitting next to him and says, yeah, but before you can teach them to read, you've got to teach them to believe in themselves. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's the fundamental 
whole issue that we're and dealing with. And yeah. that's where I was mm-hmm. at. It, it took my celly. Mm-hmm. What happened when, when I first started to read, I went to sit down with my attorney, and I'm asking him, now, why are they trying to give me a life sentence without the possibility of parole? Uh, I just sold drugs. You mm-hmm. know? And he gives me these three pieces of paper, and for the first time in my life, I noticed that I wanted to know what was on a piece of paper. Mm. Before that, I never wanted to know what was on a piece of paper. I mm-hmm. didn't care. You know, I didn't care why Jack and Jill was going up the hill. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Mama Han was talking about the lights bill needed to be paid. And yeah, no yeah, you had, you had, you had real, real, real life concerns. Like, where am I going to get my next meal? Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, my tennis shoes got holes in them, and, you know, my socks all got the same hole. In each one of them, because <laughs> <laughs> I've been walking on my socks instead of my shoes, so um, I had real issues, and 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 I believe that if it would have been broke down to me at an early age, that uh, books had the kind of information that could get me out of my situation, mm-hmm. I think I would have been much more amped to uh, to, to read. To read, yeah, me. absolutely. Do you think that the, the the situation has gotten better for? Say African Americans in in your neighborhood. No, uh, uh-uh. uh. I go to my schools and 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 I talk to the kids. Mm. And I mean, I've been to, to ghettos in Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago. Uh, you know, some of the roughest schools in in the country. And and I talk to them. And I don't think the system gets it yet. You know that mm. uh, you can't teach somebody that you can't engage. You know. Uh, I just spoke to a group of kids the other day, and and uh, what they said is that I engaged with them. You know, I understood them, and they engaged with me. So uh, the first thing the system has to do is we have to start engaging with them. We have to make a contact with them where where we understand them and they understand us. <clears throat> hmm. And I hope when I wrote this book, that's what I wrote this book for, uh, so that to engage with uh, the people that's not being engaged with. Yeah, that's that's why a book like this is so important to me. Absolutely, and, and that's why <laughs> that's why your example is so important. And, and and talk to us a little bit about, I mean, what it's like to be quote unquote a drug kingpin, quote unquote public enemy number one. <laughs> and, and, you know, and 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 stressful, and stressful. <laughs> and, I mean, dealing with that kind. Of, how much is the most you've? How much cash have you had in your hand at one time? Well, you couldn't hold it in your hand. <laughs> man. Oh, man. I used to have two guys carrying the duffel bag sometimes. So we, we had a lot of cash, like three, maybe $3.2 million. Didn't you know in, in the back? In <clears throat> 20s, 10s, and 50s, and 100s. So it's big, big, big stack of money. Crazy. Uh, That's amazing. And you must have been constantly worried that somebody was going to take you out. Constantly worried. Not, no. really, not really worried about somebody taking me out. Uh because I, I ran I ran a type of operation that, that you don't really fear. It's kind of like, almost like a Mother Teresa was. You know, where I don't need all the bodyguards and, and the security because my community would take care of me. You really? Know, if you came over to my community and you tried to do something with me, they was going to let you have it. Well, the most fascinating thing I thought was when you had to post bail and your mom's neighbors put the mortgage, <laughs> their house or whatever it was. Yeah, so everybody that they came forward because they, they did a yeah. 22, a 2251, I think that's the name of it, I, I, if I remember correctly. Uh, they had a million dollar bond, meaning that all property, all monies had to come in front of the judge and the judge was going to interview everybody who named it the house was in and go through their background and everything. So I couldn't put up any of the property I had. Yeah. Accumulated. So what happened is my mom told the neighbors and all the neighbors came up and they raised like one and a half million dollars. It's amazing. Uh, Why do you think they did that? Because they knew me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They loved me. They, their kids. I mean, the reason my neighbors didn't tell on me because their kids was involved. Their kids was benefiting. They benefited. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when, it was when, all, it's also a community. And I mean, I mean, as far as like the drug business is a community. It's a community thing. I mean, you know, one guy goes to prison and gets punished. But the whole community benefited. The, the, the liquor store guy, he benefited because now people in the neighborhood are spending more money at his store. The, the car wash, he benefited. <clears throat> I mean, if you're really going to get rid of the, 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 the drug business the way they're trying to do it right now, you got to start locking up everybody who touched this money and know that it's illegal money. 100%. And if you're not doing that, you, you're not doing anything. Are you saying that the war on drugs hasn't worked? <laughs> Are you trying to suggest that le- making drugs illegal is a bad... Look, what do you think about legalizing drugs? Doesn't it make sense? Or is there any way to... What, what is your take on that? I mean, well, we, and would you legalize every drug? <clears throat> you have to come to some compromise. I mean, because... 
illegal drugs, kids can get on the street. Yeah. Illegal drugs like cigarettes, who kill more people than anybody, and they alcohol. can't they can't go and buy cigarettes. It's hard for a kid to get a pack of cigarettes, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so right there tells you that, that that something's wrong, you know. And, and I don't know what the answer is, you know. Maybe we need to get a think tank of people who 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 been in it, who lived in it, uh, been around it, and not just the people who who sit on Capitol Hill and and make the decisions for everybody, you know, Big Brother. Uh, I mm-hmm. think that we all need to sit down and 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 come up with some uh, some viable answers. Well, let's talk about Big Brother for a second. Let's talk about the government because I was shocked to realize that you know there is and the the story was broken that there is a CIA link. Yeah. People because people kept saying, "Look, how are these drugs getting into these neighborhoods? I mean, who's actually taking these drugs from countries like Nicaragua and getting them into the neighborhood?" Now, people are resourceful, of course, and when there's that kind of money on, on the line, they're going to find a way. But this was an organized thing, and the Contras needed cash. Yep. Uh, they needed weapons. Yep. Uh, can you talk about the CIA Well, link? I think you should back up a little bit and give a little con- uh, context on the Iran-Contra thing. Yeah. Right? So, uh, essentially, in the, in the 1980s, the Reagan administration was trying to fund anybody who would fight communism anywhere around the world, and that meant this group called the Contras in Nicaragua. Um, and it was basically found that the Reagan administration was selling arms to Iran and then using that money to provide weapons for the Contras. It turns out that it wasn't just money to from selling arms in Iran that they were funneling to the Contras. It was also... The money, yeah. From drugs. <laughs> From drugs, yeah. <laughs> and you can't leave out uh, Gary Webb, uh, rest in peace, you mm-hmm. know, who who broke my story and the Contras and the whole nine yards. Um, how everybody jumped on him. Yeah. You know, when Gary came out and said, hey, we found a link. You know, Rick Ross is the link to the streets, to, to the White House. Uh, well, you know, everybody crucified him. You know, L.A. Mm-hmm. Times, uh, Washington Post, New York Times. I mean, it was, it was like a... A slaughter out there you know everybody went at him and then uh they do this big investigation you know the cia director comes down to to my jail cell <laughs> talk to me maxine waters and some other congress uh, people come down and inspector general from the uh oig and uh, think about this man this is crazy. this is a movie right. man well there's actually gary webb ha- there's a movie coming out about gary webb's life this year isn't there yeah kill the messenger yeah and who's in that i mean it's a pretty big movie um, I can't remember. I, I don't know who all's in there, but I know they got a guy playing my role, uh, Michael K. Williams. You know, we spoke on the phone. Uh, thanks to him, you know, they, they had me. I was going to be a mad, fire-breathing dragon, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he said, man, I met with Rick. He's nothing like that. Right. Y'all got him all wrong. Surprise, surprise. Rick don't even curse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, I was glad that, uh, that he did have the decency to at least reach out to me and... Uh, and and get to know me a little bit, yeah. You know, before you play my role, you know, yeah. you are gonna play my role, and you know, he, they got me cursing out the judge and just. Well, just, you, you, and your connection was this Nicaraguan who had been your longtime provider of drugs, uh, right? And and it, and uh, my informant. And your informant. He's the, both. The he who, played both roles. That's right. Man. <laughs> the guy who put you away ultimately, right? Oh, well, he did. He well, at least they thought he did. Yeah. Is he? He's. We don't know where he is at this point, do we? He oh, kinda, he's in Nicaragua now. Okay, but he got yeah. um, he got citizenship, I think. No, like no, green no. Card. We green had green card. we had green him card. kicked out. I, I went okay. and did the research oh. and found out he couldn't have a green card. And I told oh. him to take it back. Really? Yeah, I made him take his green card back. Uh-huh. I did go. that don't on mess. my own. I got him kicked out of the country. Don't mess with Rick Ross. <laughs> <laughs> don't mess. That's but, what happens. But what the illiterate, the same one who couldn't read or write, but he learned the immigration law. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. But the, I th- one of the things that I also thought was really interesting was that, um, you know, when 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 you think about drug dealing, you think about violence and you think about gangs. And one of the myths that you really dispel in the book was the fact that gang activity was really separate from drug dealing activity. Absolutely. You know, every murder happens in South Central. Oh, it was drug related. You know, these guys are fighting over a girl. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? (laughs) And then they turn into drug related, you know. So it it just made sense. Um, But it all went to this whole picture that they was trying to draw of the the black young drug crack dealer. We Mm -hmm. need to put him in prison forever. You know, we're going to get rid of them. You know, these are the guys that are messing up this country. You know, so they made this picture of of, of a people that, you know, is 600,000 of them in prison right now. 600,000. And, and, 
you know, uh, the black population is only like 13%, and I guess the black male is probably like maybe 6 or 7% of that. Mm. Uh, wow. And then you take 600,000 and put in prison, um, you know, those numbers are crazy. Yeah. The whole country of India only has 300,000 in prison. <clears throat> so something is wrong with this system, and, and one of my goals is to uh, to help fix it. Mm. And that's another reason why I wrote this book. So, well, what what made you? Do you think made you good at at being able to organize and distribute the kind of the kind of quantity you did, and then to manage the money you did, and to stay out of jail as long as you did? How did you do that? I mean, what was the thought process? Well, well, I really felt like when I was around, uh, wow, well, maybe six or seven uh, in Texas, I went to a doctor office and um and remember I couldn't read and so on this TV they got this big pretty TV color TV and they got a sign on it that says white only no yeah and then they said I go and turn the TV on and they yell at me and tell my mom hey you can't be touching that TV so after that they tell us hey you guys gotta go in the back and then we go in the back and they got this little shabby black and white TV and the knobs all broke off and the place is dirty and there's cigarette butts everywhere and something popped in my mind is that there's a difference between being white and black, mm -hmm. you know, and when I came up and all along, you know, I wanted what I saw whites having and uh, when cocaine popped up, I felt like, wow, this is something that they have and I can get a hold to it. Right. Mm. So when I started selling cocaine, I sold it with the same intensity that I felt the day that they told me I couldn't touch that TV. Hmm. It's amazing how That's, one little seminal yeah. event. Absolutely. Don't but, don't if you don't tell that kid not to touch that TV, are you going to create a huge <laughs> drug dealer? <laughs> well, I'm going to create a drug kingpin right there. Right, and essentially, I mean, you know, that's the thing that you you've been credited pretty much with creating the crack epidemic in some ways. It might be a little yeah, unfair. They they do, but uh, um, I probably was one of the biggest promoters of it because, mm -hmm. um, like I said, I didn't invent it. I didn't learn how to cook it. Right. I wasn't the first person cooking it in the South Central. Somebody taught me how to cook it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am credited being the first millionaire crack dealer. Mm -hmm. That could be possible. Did you know you were going to go to jail? Uh, after a while, I did. You did? No, I didn't care. You, you didn't care? You no. were living on borrowed time? Yeah, yeah. My family was going to be good. They were going to have businesses. And when I got out of jail, I was going to be okay. Right. And that's what I thought. Until the, <laughs> until the government came down and took everything away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're pretty ruthless about that, aren't they? Oh, without a doubt. You know what? Listen, the only part of the government that always works <laughs> is the tax collection bureau. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, even the way that they are allowed the DEA agents and the police to get rewards and raises and all that stuff is geared toward corruption. I mean, anytime you pay a cop, by how many kilos he sees or how many cars he take, um, you're lining the system up for failure. Mm -hmm. I mean, say for instance right now, uh, in San Diego, that's why I got arrested. Now, when I got arrested that second time, I hadn't been selling drugs for like six or seven years. So I was totally out of the drug business. I quit on my own. They didn't make me quit. I quit on my own. Mm -hmm. I quit a year and a half before I ever got arrested. Well, when they came up, and to set us up on this deal, my partner was not a 100-kilo drug dealer. They could not charge him with being a 100-kilo drug dealer. So they couldn't just arrest him because I made the introduction here. Y'all meet. Y'all do what you want to do. So what they did is they talked him into bringing me back into the fold so they could make it now a 100-kilo drug dealer. So now it looks good on DEA's records because they mm -hmm. just arrested 100 kilos instead of one or two kilos. So when when you put a system on those bases, uh, I mean, this whole system is lying for for failure, which it's doing. Yeah. So in other words, if you if if you the incentive is to catch capture, so if you get if the incentive is that you get rewarded for you know finding a hundred kilos versus two kilos, I guess that would be the absolutely. Idea. Yeah. The point is, if you're rewarded for catching big fish, then you exaggerate your catch size. You know yeah. what I mean? The the thing about that the Rockefeller laws and this whole backlash was that the violence got so bad in the eighties. I remember it pretty well. I mean, people were getting shot left and right. And it really carried over into the nineties. I mean, there were kids who were just coming in one after another, fourteen year old kids, you know, dead, shot, young men, mostly young black men, young black boys. 
And I, I feel like a lot of times it was just politicians and, and mostly the white power structure didn't know what to do, did not know what to do and said, look, we got to we got to get law enforcement on the street and we got to make the penalty for having any kind of drug on you severe. And that'll stop all this insanity. Um, you know, obviously, in some ways, in a sick way, it did work. You took a lot of men off the street. The Wire does a great job of showing how devastating it was to communities. You, but what, what the problem was, you took you were incarcerating so many people for so long that their whole lives were done. Yeah. If you could have a little vial of crack on you and you, you were going away for 18 years, and I think it's called On the Ropes, the female boxer, and she they found literally a tiny vial and, and they she tried to flush down the toilet. She went away, man, for, I can't remember what it was, but I kept in touch with yeah, her. Yeah, for, for three grams of crack, you can get uh, five years in prison. Yeah, now uh, think about that. For <laughs> an ounce, you can get 10. And, and then if you have a prior conviction, it goes up to 20. <clears throat> wow. And so they warehouse you for twenty years. Now and, you and it kills the taxpayers. You're talking about one guy, forty five, fifty thousand dollars a year, mm-hmm. not counting medical bills. There you go. And and you're wasted away. You're just kind of. How did you deal with jail? How did, you were you were in jail for how long? Well, um, I did twenty years. Well, I start off fighting my case. You know, I, I love how nonchalantly he says that. I did twenty years. Twenty years in jail <laughs> is a lot of time. Well, when you're in there, it doesn't seem like that. Well, you know, when you walk around and there's other guys with 70 and 80 years. You know, um, and then on that other thing that you was talking about, yeah, they did wipe out the street with drug dealers. But they were letting rapers and murderers mm-hmm. and robbers out of jail early so that they could make room for drug dealers. And, and you know, also, <clears throat> I saw a documentary on, a, on some cops, and these cops were in homicide. Great homicide cops. But they quit homicide because they said they could get faster promotions fighting drugs. Mm-hmm. <coughs> yeah, there you go. There, there so, you go. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I was in jail, I started off doing law, you know what I'm saying, I taught myself to read, then I started doing my law work, and I went from there to uh, studying business. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I spent my time reading. I read about 300 books before I left prison. Wow. Um, I read the L.A. Times every day, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, another little business newspaper that I can't think of, Time time magazine i mean i really consume myself with learning mm-hmm. that's that's the way to do it isn't it i mean in a lot absolutely of, yeah. that's the only way to do it i mean if you're sitting there uh the jail's not going to give you no school and you know they took out the college programs that they used to have where guys could go to college uh you can still go to college if you can afford to pay for it uh, but if you can't afford to pay for it then you're on your own did you make friends did in you, jail did you have friends when you went in Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, they treat me in jail like they treat me out here. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Just because there was a lot of respect for what you had done. Yeah, same thing. I mean, you know, guys in there uh, credit me with uh, a lot of them with making their money. You know, they learned the game from me, they say. What'd they call you? Uh, the ones who got to know me would call me Rick, and the ones who didn't would call me Freeway Rick. Yeah, there you go. Freeway yeah. Rick. But there are a lot of tough people in jail, a lot of people with, with, things, <clears throat> with things to prove and... You hear the stories, and I got a friend right now who's doing a stretch in, in you know, Florida and penitent- penitentiary. Oh, and jail is definitely dangerous. It's dangerous. I saw a guy uh, get beat over the head with a steel mop ringer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw a guy get beat over the head with a bat. Um, I was in the shower one day, and uh, I heard something slamming up against the wall so hard that I couldn't believe what, what could be hitting the wall that hard. And when I uh, walked out the shower, it was a guy being stabbed. You know, right next to the shower. Damn. So I saw some pretty brutal stuff in jail. Um, but you I were mean, able to kind of avoid it because you stayed out of that kind of mix. Yeah, yeah. You know, usually, usually in jail, you know, they're fighting over same thing: drugs, mm. um, homosexual activity, mm. gambling, the TV. You know, um, people it, get people get killed over the TV. I mean, um, they will literally kill you for touching the TV while. Jerry Springer's on. <laughs> Amazing. So it's a question of just maybe sitting there with your books and keeping your head down and not, not affiliating necessarily with, because it breaks up in the gangs too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, but if you go to your cell, you know, like I would do, you know, yeah. when I come in from New York doing my workout, I go to my cell, get in my bunk, uh, put my pillow up and grab me a book. Mm-hmm. You know, usually nobody come to your cell and, and bother you. Mm-hmm. Just doing that, you, that 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 saying, my friend always says, you gotta you gotta do the time. Don't let the time do you. Yeah, that's all a good those, saying. All those, yeah. <laughs> He'll schedule everything in his life. You know, he schedules. He's got a whole schedule. He works in a leather shop, and and you gotta have stuff. it. You gotta have it like that. I spent most of my time in the law library, and 
usually nothing really happens in a lot of Liberia. Every now and then, you know, two guys would get into it somewhere else, and and they really wanted to get get it squared away, and they would come in the law library and yeah, and duke it out in the bathroom. Let's go to the law library. <laughs> Let's go to the law and duke it out <laughs> among the law books, man. And I'll read you why I was right. <laughs> oh, my God. Why you were unlawful. Read you the right act. Let's see yeah. what the judge says. Huh? Exactly. What would the judge say in this situation? <laughs> exactly. That's amazing. Yeah, but usually I stayed away from that kind of stuff. The most dangerous times I had is when I played football and basketball. That's oh, is that was, right? Yeah, that's when I was more vulnerable. Uh, why do you, what do you mean? Well, because I was in physical sports <clears> that – other guys were into mm-hmm. you know when I played tennis you know you playing an individual sport but you know on the basketball court you foul somebody wrong yeah uh, matter of fact one time uh, when I first got up to USP Lompoc I almost caused a riot because um, I fouled a guy on an accident and uh, the guy jumped up and he wanted to fight you know and he was from the Bay Area and uh, mm-hmm. you know L.A. wasn't going to let that happen. No way. <laughs> Not with precious Rick Ross. <laughs> so, so the whole bleachers cleared up, you know. But um, I apologized to the guy and told him it was an accident. And me and him were friends. And, you oh, know, it was cool then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cooled him down, you know. Well, you, you, you are obviously somebody who's got a great deal of wisdom and, and common sense. And, yeah. You well, know and what that's, I mean? I mean and that's, not... Yeah. And, I mean, in terms of, you know, why did you succeed in the drug game, you know, from what I really got from the book is, you know, you didn't use, right? No. And, you know, you really treated it like a business. It, it was a business. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. The, the, the rappers that have done so well, that so the legend goes, and I've talked to a lot of rap producers who said, the ones that made a lot of money were also the ones who learned how to make a lot of money and run a business when they were dealing. I mean... You know, Jay Z. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, assume, but uh, there there has been rumor that that Jay Z and Fifty Cent, etc. The, the the I don't the think ones with that, Fifty Cent. I don't think it's rumor. I think it's pretty yeah, well established yeah. that Fifty Cent <laughs> deal but, drugs. But learning distribution, learning how to manage people, learning how to how to the discipline of running a business was then basically transferred into the rap game. Yeah, uh, and that's what I've heard. You know? Definitely, definitely, it, 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 definitely. All the skills. I mean, you know, I've read Sam Walton's book. I read uh, Phil Knight. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I don't know how many Bill Gates, Donald Trump, and I saw all of them in the drug business. All of them. <laughs> it's the same thing. Same principles. Was there was there somebody, uh, an author you read, uh, an example that you read about that, that stands out more than anybody else? Do you have a hero? Sam Walton. I love Sam Walton. Wow. Yeah. I wow. Mean, he still runs this country from the graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he does, doesn't he? Sam Walton, for you guys, created Walmart. Yeah, he runs He runs that. this country from the graveyard. He made all of his stuff that he wanted his company to, to live by and stand on uh, before he passed, and uh, they're going to keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, his ability to what, what what was it about? I mean, he, he just he was kind of a pioneer in that sense, and just being able to manage. Yeah, he was just ruthless. You know, he made mistakes, and you know, and and sometimes the mistakes turn out to be you know some he didn't plan on happening. You know, turn out to be a good thing for him. Mm-hmm. I know one incident where uh, he ordered a truckload of uh, Thai washing powder, and they brought like ten or fifteen trucks. So he was looked at his parking lot, and he got all these trucks out there with. Ty washing powder and what he did, he said, "You know what? I'm gonna sell it at cost." Just like that, and yep. that was this. That was the start. And that that turned it on for him. Well, how important is it when you're running a drug business to be Machiavellian and ruthless and 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 otherwise, how how in in terms of like also motivating your your workers and keeping them happy? I mean, how do you do that? I mean, what the idea of a drug dealer? on your scale is he's a Machiavellian guy with an army and, and ruthless and if you cross him you die. Well well you know you gotta you gotta let guys know that, that they can't come and take what you own, you know, and, and it's always that threat, you know, and that was one of the reasons I carried a pistol and wore bulletproof vests because I knew that guys knew that I was rich, you know, they knew that I was running around LA and at any given time, you know, uh probably had a car that I was following or a car that was following me that might have had a million dollars or five hundred thousand in it. You know, so to be running around L.A. at that time, you know, when the average person is making, you know, two hundred dollars a week, one hundred fifty dollars a week salary, and you run around L.A. with, you know, half a million dollars or a million dollars or two million dollars, you know, sometimes even three point two million dollars in a duffel bag, uh, it's dangerous. Yeah. So I'd uh, say. they have to know that that you will defend yourself. 
But that's also, I mean, this goes back to what we were talking about with Datcher Keltner, right? In the sense that this is a society that, you know, and, and a business that operates outside of the rules of law, right? There's no trust. You can't rely on the police to protect you and all that sort of stuff because oh, you're doing something illegal. Absolutely, you can't count on the police. That's why yeah. robbers are so keen to uh, to rob drug dealers because they know that the drug dealer are hesitant to call the police. That's right. And, and to, uh, how, did you, how did you negotiate, though, the, the, the Crips blood feud? Because I would imagine you'd probably hire some of the shot callers around the neighborhood and created peace that way. I don't know how you did that. Well, you know, I, I, it's, it's crazy how um, I never gangbang. No. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to, but mm-hmm. I never did. So I never had those... Uh, skeletons to carry around with me. Mm. You know, it was nobody that would say, well, you know, Rick jumped on me when I was this age or he mm-hmm. shot at me or nothing like that was with me. So uh, I was cool to go to the different areas. So Because you were neutral. You were kind of like, you weren't a blood or a crip. You were neutral. I then. was neutral. And you weren't <laughs> blue or red. You were purple. And I think, <laughs> I think it's in the book how I stumbled up on one day I'm at the skating yeah. ring. That's and, why I brought it up. And um, this guy, man... Big dude, big dude, bad dude, you know, at that time. Um, he uh, walked up to me, and me and him had had a little sand a couple weeks before that where I had a pistol on me, and I was like, man, you ain't you ain't whooping nobody here tonight. Right. I got my pistol. So uh, when I saw him, he had about three or four guys with me, so I was pretty scared. Um, but he gave me a friendly smile. And mm. when he did that, you know, I said, no, he told me, he said, oh, you're you doing pretty good right now. I hear you're doing real good for yourself. And I was like, yeah, I am. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, come by the house tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, I'd always looked up to him, and, and uh, he came by, and I put him down. And the rest was history. He came back with so much money. I was like, wow, maybe I better go to the Nickersons and the PJs. So in other words, you kind of you kind of broke him off a piece of your action. Yeah. To keep things, but it's not even a piece cool. of your action. You I like them using an o- street terminology, man. Oh well, I appreciate that, but it's more <laughs> that you were giving them an opportunity, right? I gave them you opportunity. Get opportunity to make their own money. It's not charity. Mm. It's like no, it, was, it looked like charity, but it wasn't. It yeah. was. It was kind of. I don't even know if it was given a loan. Uh, because, buying security, weren't you? Yeah. Well, no, buying security, no, but I also I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't doing it for the security. Mm. I, I was doing it for the fact that I knew that. What I had, I was getting it at fourteen hundred an ounce, and I could give it to him for twenty two hundred an ounce, and just maybe he would take it and triple it up or double it up, mm-hmm. and that's exactly what happened. He came back with like forty thousand dollars off of four ounces, eight ounces. I'm not quite sure the numbers right now, but he came back with enough money to 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 pay for it. Yeah. Wow. And I did that before with my guys. <laughs> But I never did it with like one of the shot callers, mm-hmm. right? From from the different size of the area, you know. I'd already seen that with like my little partners in the neighborhood. Yeah, it's you had all- you had trouble selling it. I know you didn't. Your mother, you, you were actually afraid of your mother. I mean, in other words, if your mother saw you buying all this stuff, she'd know that yeah. you what you were up to. My mom was strict. So funny, like he's like, I can't let my mom know. I'm, I'm a huge, <laughs> I'm a huge drug kingpin. My, my mom, my, my mom, mom is be a, so mad at me. My mom is a diehard Christian. Okay, mm-hmm. a diehard Christian. You know, with her, oh, you selling drugs, you going to hell, right? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, she's gonna curse you into hell. So you know, I was like, I don't want her to know. So what? The, my my real question with all of this is, you know, Francis Fukuyama said that history is a quest for dignity. Um, and it seems to me that what we're really talking about is that the African American community has been denied dignity, and so they try and find dignity in whatever ways they can through either gang membership or you know making money in whatever way they can, Absolutely. music, sports, and all that sort of stuff. And so what we really, I mean, if, if you want to solve this, if you want to, you need to create better paths to dignity, and part of that is education. But I'm actually reminded of you know after the war in Iraq, we came in. And we basically, all of Saddam's security forces, we kicked them out, right? So you take them from being important people to being totally outside. 
And what we should have offered them is a path from being one of Saddam's people to being, you know, the new kind of police force and all of that sort of new stuff. New kind of army and all exactly. that. Exactly. And so it seems to me that there's a similar thing there where, you know, the people who are in gangs and the people who are drug dealers, you have to offer them because it sounds like being a drug dealer is stressful, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So you need to offer them a path from being a drug dealer to being a contributing member of society. Absolutely. I mean, you just imagine waking up every morning and saying, oh, today I might go to prison. Or Mm -hmm. die. Or Or die. die. The problem is how do you do that? I mean, these are... Well, but I think that's the thing. It's a good question, though. That's the question to ask. You're asking the right question. Yeah, but I I think that's the thing. I think it's entirely possible. I mean, there are lots of problems in this community, right? You have to offer them ways into, for example, the police force, or you have to offer them ways into being educators or, you know, community outreach officials or, you know, whatever it is. But there have to be mechanisms where instead of... Well, you know, Pete Brown, I mean, I know the cops, they take a lot of credit for... uh, I mean, not Pete Brown, but Pete Carroll. You know, the cops take a lot of credibility for the crime going down in L.A. But I got an inside scoop. You know, Pete Brown had a program where he Pete, was... Pete Carroll, you mean the... Uh, Pete the, Carroll, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the the he, coach, you're talking about the coach. The coach USC. from USC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, he started a program in South Central L.A. where he was going around hiring gang leaders to police their community. Yeah. So if something went, went wrong, then... The guys who ran his program, because one of my friends was the head of the program, they would call in all the guys, and they would sit down at a, at a table and say, hey, what happened here? Okay, go get this guy, go get that guy, bring him to the table, let's sit down, let's get it square. And the crime rate had, like, vanished. But see, that's the thing. That, exactly. I mean, the point is the program has been tried, and it has succeeded, apparently. I mean, you need to you need to engage... Rather than just trying to remove them from the community, because when you remove 600,000 African-American men from the country, you've removed 600,000, you know, fathers, brothers, and all that sort of stuff. And you destroy the family and structure. Potential earners, potential and potential earners and all that sort of stuff. Innovators and et cetera. Yeah, you've destroyed the community structure and you've laid the groundwork for the next generation of problems. And you also committed enemies. Yeah. You know, because these guys go to prison and, and they're come mad. Come out angry. They come right. out angry. Yeah, they're mad. Yeah. You know, they, they're like, how are you going to give me... All this time for for selling something that I didn't hurt anybody that mm-hmm. people actually ask for, you know, drug dealers don't go out and 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 put guns on people and make them take drugs. You know, people actually chase them down with money in their hand and Look, say, "Hey, please man, take my money." Listen, man, you can go. I can take you to uh, the Hamptons or any exclusive club in New York or any big city, <clears throat> and you can get as much cocaine as you want. And these kids are these these kids are shooting it in their nose. And so there is an absolute demand from the wealthy stratum of society, and it's provided by <clears throat> people taking all the risk. So everybody's guilty. Right. Everybody's guilty, man. Yeah, you know? Absolutely. And but I the- believe that you're just as guilty if you take one snort, one time. Then you're just as guilty as the kingpins. I agree. I mean, the, the, you're, you're, the, look, some people are providing the, they're providing the product, and if you're ingesting the product, you're, you're creating a demand for it. So exactly. there is a great deal of hypocrisy, but I don't think that's lost on most people. I, I think that the things we're talking about, if you talk to the most people, the, most people understand there's a common sense approach to drug enforcement. Uh, maybe, maybe there isn't. There shouldn't. Yeah, be but drug I think it's there's, there's a good debate out there. I'm saying, but. The real issue is these programs that you're talking about that Pete Carroll came up with and stuff like that. I think that, that most of the problem stems from the fact that most people who have resources, let's just talk about the white community. I think that most people who have resources in the white community who want a better, who mean everyone the best and understand what injustices mean and it bothers them. The frustration comes with not knowing what to do. Yes, but they don't know what to do because they've tried to understand the problem rationally. They think that there's some law they're going to pass or that they're going to put a certain number of (laughs) cops on the street and that's going to fix it. And what's going on is it's an issue of dignity. It's an issue of emotion. It's an issue of psychological trauma. It's an issue of humanity. Okay, so you're right. So 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 when we talk about this all the time, he wrote a book about this. Yeah, but 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 so let's let's just talk. We're not looking for answers, but give me an example of how we start. To address this problem, oh, you, you. I mean, I think firstly, the the country needs a, a process of truth and reconciliation. There needs to be a process where we talk about our history, we talk about what has really happened, we talk about what's going on. Don't we do that a lot? No, we don't. We don't. We there. You know, the, the the conversation that's had is slavery was bad, it was wrong, and it was over. 
you know, <laughs> as opposed to talking about what is the psychological experience of being a kid like Rick Ross, where you're growing up and you think that reading books, learning are not for you. Right. You haven't dealt with the fact that this person feels that those paths to dignity are cut off for them and will never. Yeah, be you're not going to be a lawyer. It's exactly. He doesn't believe it. You know, and yeah, you, I didn't believe it. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know I was smarter than my you, lawyer. You didn't think you could. You didn't think you, I didn't you think were I capable. Could. Exactly. I didn't know I, but I didn't know I was smarter than my lawyer who went to Harvard. <laughs> my lawyer graduated from the top of his class in Harvard University. Mm-hmm. I didn't think that I was as smart as he was. I, I listened to him. Everything he told me to do, I listened to it mm-hmm. until I found out that I could just be smarter than he was. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Once I learned how to read the law and I started showing him the law and he's like, oh, no, that's not what it means. And I'm like, that's what it says. on." <laughs> yeah. yeah. So... Until we get our kids to where they understand that they can compete with everybody else, then I think that... They've done a lot of very disheartening surveys on, on African-American, like a lot of men, <clears throat> and they found it was something like 19% or 20% didn't believe they were even as capable as white counterparts. Of course. And that's, and that's, that's the enemy. The, that's the, the idea and that then you, don't, what, you don't have the potential. And then look what they're doing to them right now. Mm. Right now, they're telling you that you can be like Jay-Z. Right. All you got to do is go out and sell a little crack. There you go. <laughs> then you can take that crack money and turn it into a rap career. And turn it into a rap career and then you'll get to sit with the President of the United States and never pay a price for it. Yeah. See, now they criticized me because I was a kingpin and I went to prison. But guys who never went to prison or say they, they sold drugs and never went to prison They'll let them come to the White House. They'll let them go to our colleges, and they brag about selling drugs mm-hmm. right now today. And know. also, I mean, part of what makes rappers like Jay-Z and 50 Cent cool legit. is the fact that they sold drugs. Like, that's part of well, their Well, they're cachet. legit. They're from exactly. the street. It's like the real Rick Ross versus the Rick Ross. I mean, you know, he the, all those guys, he took on your name because it gave him... Credibility. Yeah. Yeah. But our society allows him to come on to the campus... Well, because and brag about selling drugs. Well, because that would be considered the, the tragedy is that that's considered a man, that's considered a badass, that's considered you know all that stuff. You broke the rules, all that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, as, as opposed to, to saying that if you grow up and you learn an instrument, and you learn how <laughs> to uh, think outside the box, and you are well read, and you immerse yourself in in the smart and in, in the best that's been thought and said. That that should be that should be what a real man is in the 21st century in uh, a civilized and, society. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's certainly what a productive person is. That's right. Be an innovator. That's right. You, young man, black young man, who's 11 years old, you have the same potential as, as Steve anybody. Jobs, that's as right. Bill Gates, as any Sam Walton, Steve Jobs whoever said, it is. Yeah, you sent me this. He, There's Hunter an amazing said, video of Steve Jobs talking. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Jobs said, "Once you learn that the world, everything around you, life is created by people no smarter than you are, everything changes." And it's really true. And that probably sounds like what you kind of came across when you, here's in this prison. Harvard lawyer, man. Mm-hmm. You're like, wait a minute. I, I had to go to prison this. to figure that though. Yeah. You know, in my community, it was Superfly. Mm-hmm. It was Superfly. Yeah. And went, so your community needs fly. needs needs uh, different role models. No, what your community needs is what every community needs, which is to destroy the idea that people are born smart. That's what it all comes down to, you know, thinking it's that true, like Hunter. it's 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 that's basically that. I mean, we you know, in the book I wrote, we call it the worst idea ever, and it is. I mean, yeah. that is the idea that is the poison was the poison pill in your life. It's the I poison agree. pill in in everybody's lives because it gets in the way of them rather than, you know, we get intimidated by things and think we think they're not for us rather than just getting stuck in and learning them and doing them and realizing that everything is possible for us. But the media is bombarding them with this lifestyle, mm-hmm. this gangster thug lifestyle that it doesn't give them a chance. Mm-hmm. I mean, if all you hear all the time is that I'm a thug and everybody that you see that's successful is a thug, mm-hmm. then... You know, the first hero you're going to meet. If you grow up in South Central, the first moneymaker that you're going to meet is going to be a drug dealer. And that's mm-hmm. that's a reality in 2014. And the first person you're going to meet with respect is the head of a gang. <clears throat> exactly. Mm. Um, yeah, and now let's talk a little bit, because I was just reminded by Rena, my wonderful engineer. Um, let's talk about what you're doing now. I mean, you're talking all over the all over the country. Yeah. And, and you are also a... I got my own record label. Rick Ross Music Group. Uh, my book was just released, and right now, one of my artists is out here from Georgia. She hot. Hello. She is indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, and uh, we we just you know we going around me and her. You know uh, she's in the studio with a few people. You know we're gonna get her some 
some better music than what she already has in which she mm-hmm. already had was hot but you know I'm gonna put her <laughs> with a few named people and uh, see if we can come up with a smash she's talented yeah. she's talented thank you thank TP9 you. yes and very cute how old are you I'm 17 I'm 17 years old <laughs> the fact that I'm saying she's really cute at 30 years older than she is man what, yeah. what a creep I am like I got a daughter I got a daughter who's gonna be 17 in 11 years somebody kill me <laughs> in somebody kill me man <laughs> Listen, then you you are you're a doll and you're only seventeen and you're talented. You, you yes. just you meant you. you meant cute in like a, a daughterly like, way. Though. That's exactly yeah. what I meant. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly I get it. What yeah. I, meant. I get it. That's my daughter. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, uh, t- tell us a little bit about how you met Rick and and your journey. Well, I started music um, when I was around nine years old, um, and I moved to St. Louis, and then I moved to Atlanta and my mom is my manager so she started to work um, we had a mutual friend and we were working with him and uh, he was friends with Rick Ross Music Group and we kind of got through that connection and he told Rick about me and everybody else on Rick Ross Music Group and they checked out my music and they loved it so um, just by hearing Rick's story I was inspired and I was moved by um, how he did that change because I want to be um a positive artist that goes out and speaks to the community and, you know, be more engaging. And when I heard Rick's story, I was just like, that's the that's that's what I want to be around. That's exactly what I want to do. So um, I'm just out here with Rick, you know, promoting this book and also um, just trying to make new music and 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 have fun. She's a she's a well-spoken Articulate she young is. lady. We gotta get on. We gotta get her own radio show. She used Thank to have you. a radio show. She's too. got a nice voice too, man. She Thank does. Her she voice does. is all like soothing. I started. I started. I kind of went. I started swooning. I was like, ah, oh, I'm so relaxed. She's a dream. <laughs> <laughs> everything. Everything is all right. She's like a dream come true. No I mean, doubt. Huh? The full package. I mean, you know, smart, intelligent, hardworking. I mean, you couldn't ask for more in an artist. Right. So Thank you. I'm fortunate, oh. you know, to have her. Yeah. Very excited. I'm very excited to be here. And you got here. a long life ahead of you, too, 17, man. Yeah, I'm and excited. Where'd you I'm learn excited. how to sing? Well, I actually shied away from singing for a long time because I was, um, I always emceed a lot and I was dancing, so that was my comfort zone. So now I'm coming out of my comfort zone because I feel like I shouldn't limit myself on anything. So I started to write my own music. I started to choreograph my own things and come up with more visuals. And I also started to take um, vocal lessons because I thought I had the voice, but I was just so used to being trapped in that box. So I had to let myself go. Yeah. And I'm, I'm working on it now. It's funny when you want to play with the big boys, when you get in, you know, you, you, you're you born, you can sing and stuff, but when you want to take it to the, to the next level. You get a little scared. You, you got, well, you, you need good tutelage, too. You right. need somebody to teach you what exactly. you're doing wrong and mm-hmm. how you can improve. It's constant. I can just tell you as a performer, just yeah. never give up. Never stop writing. Get into mm-hmm. that mindset where you're always writing, exactly. always growing, always thinking, and always practice your voice. I know people that, you know, they say Mick Jagger and a lot of people like that were always practicing, always singing, always mm-hmm. working mm-hmm. on their voice. You'd be surprised how literally how much you do it. Oh, like, yeah. You get so caught up, you don't even realize you do it. I be in Walmart all the time, and I'm just moving. I'm like, <laughs> 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 why am I moving? Like, I'm so hyper. I'm really yeah. hyper. Yeah. Well, you've got a lot to do. That's why, right? Yeah. And I'm always thinking, moving, all, all the time, just moving. Who are the uh, artists that you look up to? Oh, God. I mean, I listen to a lot of... um rappers that are Christian. Um, I love Janelle Monet. I just think she is amazing. She's different and I think she's different without trying too hard to be different. Mm. Because when you look at a lot of different artists, they come out with these crazy styles and it just kinda look forced. But when you see Janelle Monet in her suit and you, you hear her story behind um why she does it and why she dances the way she dances, it's, it's amazing. I love Michael Jackson. Who doesn't? Mm-hmm. Um I, who doesn't love Michael Jackson? I love B O B. I think he's very um, well-rounded. Mm-hmm. Um, I love Lecrae and everybody on Reach Records. Um, there's just a lot of people that I love, and I'm also inspired by my own family because I grew up in a family um, that I was just surrounded by music, so it was bound for me to be a performer or something mm. that was doing with music. So my own she family... She knows who she is, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> At 17, she is very clear. Yeah, very, yeah. very, and I grew very clear. Up, you know, my mom was a choir director, so I grew up very well in the church. Um, so... 
I was just always surrounded by music, and you know, as far as singing and everything, she helped me. She helps Listen, me with the harmonies and the, the black all church. The stuff. black church I went to. My friend's mom <laughs> died in Harlem, and I'd gone to school with him. I'd known, known him forever. I didn't know. I was the only white person in there. Let me tell you something, man. The music it was a <laughs> celebration. Yeah. <laughs> the guy goes, "Listen, Emma May's, uh, you know, she was a happy woman, so I don't want this to be a sad, sad time." <laughs> a deacon got up there, and he said he started singing, and I was like. They, I mean, they, the whole the whole congregation was one big song, man. I, yeah. I'd never experienced like anything like that in my life. It Love was it. crazy. Yeah, you it was can't better come than... out of that without being musical. <laughs> it mm-hmm. was better than cats, bro. <laughs> I'm telling you, I heard some of the best voices I've ever heard in my life in this church in Harlem. It was crazy. I love I love church. I love church, and I'm also, um, like I said, I'm not trying to limit myself. So I'm also learning guitar and, mm. and piano and. I love instruments, so I'm, when I'm done mastering that or, you know, when I get the basics of that, I think I want to learn some more. I worked with uh, Reza. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I worked with Reza from Wu-Tang Clan. I worked with a lot of rappers, really? actually, just because my first show I did out here was Mad TV. And, Brian, and could you so, rap a little for us now? Yeah, yeah. I don't have any of it in me, but... but um, <laughs> But I'll stick to stand up. I don't want to butcher. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the things I found MC Light, who I did a movie with, and, mm, and it's just some of the old really? school, and, and Queen Latifah, and and uh, and, and Ella oh, Cool J, and Ice. I, I worked with Ice T twice. I worked. I just did a movie with Ice Cube, r- Ride Along. Congratulations. So we spent yeah we spent uh, two months together. One of the things I noticed about all of them, uh, same thing, is they just a wit to a man and a woman. Disciplined, disciplined, <laughs> disciplined. Came Absolutely. from strong families and and just and just came up with the same values you're talking about. Gotcha. Just hard work and being positive and knowing what's mm. up. So, because it's a competitive game. Yeah, it is. It, it is. is. But it, but just fun. keep working. Huh. I could never get Cube out. Me, I'd be out with every night. It'd be me, Lawrence Fishburne, and John Leguizamo. And we were in Atlanta shooting the movie, and we'd go out. And Fishburne loves to smoke cigars. Now, when you get to hang out with Lawrence Fishburne as an actor, let me tell you something. That's a Hall of Famer. So I, <laughs> I, I was out every single night with him and listening to his stories, and me and John Leguizamo and stuff were hanging out with him. And and we would text a text uh, Cube to see if he wanted to come out because you know I wanted to hang out with him, and we'd see him yeah. on the set. But I just wanted to get to know him a little bit. And every single night, that dude stayed in his house. He stayed in, in, in his apartment in Atlanta. He, he was always working, always wow. writing, oh, God. always writing. He had a, a recording studio in his banger, in really? his honey mm-hmm. wagon, where he was writing songs uh-huh. and recording in, like, between takes. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. He never stops that guy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just you're, you're doing the right thing. Just keep working. Never Thank stop. Thank you. Get in that mindset. Thank you. Thank and you, you, got, and you It's got, a gift. You gift got Rick that. Ross, a very special guy in your corner who's now... You know, I, I have a feeling that if you were as, as successful as you were at the crack game, um, I, I think at the rap game, you know, you should be. Yeah, well, you know, we're we, we showing signs right now of the book. You know, the book is number 12 on Amazon. Damn. Hot 100. Woo. How so. about that? You <laughs> so. got to read the book. It really, it really is a fascinating human story about, you know. And that's independent, too. No publisher. Y- yes. No, is that right? Yeah, we independent. Well, I think you published independently, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the new way to go. I mean, why 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 pay a middleman, you know? Yeah. You you literally you upload a PDF to Amazon and every time somebody orders one copy, they print one copy. There's no warehousing, there's nothing like that. And the returns that you get per copy are so much higher. I mean, you know, normally with the traditional publisher you get cents on a copy, with this you get, you know, dollars. Yeah. So it's a big difference. Uh, that, my my one hope is that you know, with the advent of technology and the ability, the ability to get a, an education online, um, you know, and it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to get a first-rate education. I feel like with technology, people are going to be able to take classes literally on their phones, and that includes people in ghettos and what were. It's already possible to get a first-rate education online. It was a f- possible to get a first-rate education out of books in the 1800s. Abraham Lincoln did it. Yeah, you're you know, right. the, the, the it's a question of going back to what you said. That's is right. Believing that you can do. That's it. right. Yeah. I mean, you know, Rick Ross was in prison, and knowing and that he, you should do it. That's and right. First of all, you, you got to know that you should do it. See, I didn't know that I should yeah. read books. And, uh, um, that it was important for me to read books. So mm-hmm. we got we got to get them to know that they should. And Absolutely. and and you know, that's one of the things I'm most proud of this book. The ghetto is reading this book, man. Are they? Mm-hmm. Uh, man, we sold like two, three thousand books in the inner city. Wow. To That's gang great. members and, and people who said that they hadn't read a book in 20 years. Mm-hmm. I had a guy okay. bought a book for me, and he said, man, I ain't read a book in 20 years. So 
Uh, I mean, if people go online, they can see, you know, the people who are buying the book, you know, who's and, posting. And they can, can they buy your T-shirts, uh, T-shirts that say the real Rick, Rick Ross? Yeah, they can get a T-shirt, too. <laughs> 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 you know, they can get both, the shirt and the book as a package deal, and I cut you a deal. And I'm going to autograph the book. So if you order the book uh, right now, you can go to my website, uh, freewayrickrossbooks.com, and order the book. Uh, put your name on there, I'll autograph it for you, and send it back to you. And buy one of the T-shirts, man. And, and buy get one of the a shirt, too. Yeah. And yeah. We'll, we'll also put a link in the episode description. There'll be all of your stuff and then also TP9 stuff. Everybody's All of that stuff will be available. You can see the music video. You can buy the book. You can do the whole thing. Yeah, That's great. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's great, man. Thanks for joining us, man. We're, man we're thank y'all for having me, man. It was thank it was, you. It was a different interview. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> what, well, that, that's what we try to do because I wanted to get into real issues as opposed to just talking about hey, you stole crack and what was jail like and all that. I, I wanted to get yeah, into the human yeah. experience right. and, no. and and more importantly, just kind of like tackle the issues about how to how to avoid how to how to get some a young Rick Ross out there. Uh, into something productive to make the world and a that's the place. key right now you know is to save some of these guys um you know because i'm i'm the kind of person i believe that an ounce of uh prevention is better than a pound of cure absolutely and i think that the money we're sending uh spending to send guys to prison you know forty five fifty thousand, we could cut that in half and, and give two of those guys a job and and they won't commit that crime you know fix some of these streets and clean up our neighborhoods or something you know we can find something for them to do other than, than to sit in a cell uh, with their heels cocked up and figure out how they're going to get out and be bigger criminals. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Sounds like common sense to me. What a yep. surprise. What a surprise. Common sense isn't followed enough. Why don't, mm. we, why don't, we, leave, why don't we leave on some TP9? And Sounds good. Let, Sounds let, that, good. let that run a little bit. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and we're looking forward to it. She's 17 years old, but uh, I think you can tell by her voice and the music that she's got something to say and we'll have a lot more to say uh, as she gets hard. older. So TP9... Rick Ross, thank you so much for being here. Thank on you. God bless you. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, y'all man. for having us. Here we go. Peace. <laughs> You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show with Brian Callen. Be sure to like him on Facebook. Just search for Brian Callen Comedy. And follow him on Twitter. Just search for at Brian Callen. You can also find him online by visiting his website. Just go to briancallen.com. Until next time, bye-bye.